So it all comes after a lengthy investigation following the death of Vanessa Guillen. We've got the latest this noon. And it's a big day in the UK as the rollout of a coronavirus vaccine begins. What comes next and what people in the US expect on the vaccine front. Our beautiful weather pattern continues, but there are a couple subtle changes that I want to tell you about before the weekend arrives. We'll even talk about our rain chances over the next seven days. Your forecast coming up. Live from Case at 12, the news at noon starts right now. And we begin this noon with breaking news. San Antonio Animal Care Services and San Antonio Police found what they believe could be a cockfighting operation on the city's south side. Investigators called out to the 300 block of Ansley around 930 this morning. Max Massey joins us live from that scene. Max, do they know why these investigators were called out? Well, we're told that it was an anonymous tip, that we were attained a call and a complaint. Now, take a look behind me. They were able to find more than 200 hens and roosters at these two conjoining properties. Now, right now, this is what we're looking at. These are officers who have been in and out of the property, collecting the animals, putting them in the cardboard boxes, and then loading them up, taking them off. I'm told the animals and the possible operation found between these two properties here. Investigators have eyes on all of the roosters. Important to mention, the interim director director of animal care services tell me that there was no actual fighting of roosters, not that they saw right now, but they did find a few sheds and enclosures that point to a possible fighting ring. Now, there could be indications of fighting, but the investigation is still early on. Right now, one suspect of the property is in custody for unrelated charges. Veterinarians have been going on the scene, going through evidence, checking on the conditions of the birds. Now, each animal will be tagged, checked out, inspected by medical staff. They're going to be documented, then moved on over to the ACS for their set housing. Now, here's what's next in the operation. If the suspect is found guilty, they could face charges, anything from a misdemeanor all the way to a felony. But right now, even if nothing else is fine, again, early on in the investigation, the minimum that they could be facing is a Class C misdemeanor for excess of animals. David, Ursula. Thank you, Max. Also new at noon, 14 U.S. Army leaders at Fort Hood have been relieved or suspended from their posts following an independent review of the culture and the leadership on post. This review comes after several soldiers stationed there have died, including the murder of Vanessa Guillen. Sarah Costa has more on what that review found. After an outcry for change and concern about the command culture and climate at Army Base Fort Hood, high-ranking Army officials appoint an expert independent review committee to investigate the base and its command chain. This report, without a doubt, will cause the Army to change our culture. That committee visited Fort Hood from August 30th to September 15th, this after 25 soldiers assigned to the Army base between Waco and Austin have died this year. One of those deaths and murders includes 20-year-old Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen. Investigators say she was beat to death at Fort Hood by Army Specialist Aaron Robinson. Robinson killed himself this summer as police were trying to take him into custody. Guillen was missing for two months before her remains were found near the Leon River. Her family claims Robinson harassed her. However, the Army says there is no evidence to support that. Army officials will perform a dramatic purge to correct a command culture they believe has failed to address leadership failures and a pattern of violence that has included murder, sexual assault, and suicides on the base. In total, 14 leaders have been relieved or suspended from their positions. The AP says Army Lieutenant General Pat White, the base commander, is not expected to face any administrative action since he was deployed most of this year. From home, I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. New at noon, a paintbrush disguised as a gun. That's what police say a man used during a robbery at a Southside Pizza Hut. That happened with 27-year-old Matthew Garza. That's who's been arrested. He's charged with robbery. According to officers, Garza was accused of walking into a pizza hut in the 3300 block of Roosevelt Avenue on Monday night. Employees told police that the suspect grabbed an object from his waist, then demanded the money. An employee believed the suspect had a gun and opened the cash register to give him the cash. The suspect took off with the money but did not make it far. Police caught up with him three blocks away from that restaurant. Other top stories we're following this noon. A robber is still free after hitting up a north side store using a gun. That's according to San Antonio police. 
This is the man police are trying to find. Officers say he was seen at the Beer King in the 3700 block of Blanco Road on Saturday, November 28th, just before midnight. According to police, he threatened an employee with a gun and then grabbed some cash before running away. If you can help police with this case, you're asked to call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Police in Castle Hills mistakenly tried to pull a man over, sparking a chase overnight. It all started shortly after midnight near Blanco and Dresden, not far from Jackson Keller. Officers tell us they thought the vehicle the man was driving might be stolen, so they tried to pull him over. But instead, he took off. Police say the driver eventually hit some railroad tracks and tore out the vehicle's oil pan. Officers took him into custody near West Avenue and investigators say the vehicle belonged to a man's mother. So they're not sure why he refused to stop for police. New at noon, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson has filed a lawsuit against several states. That lawsuit argues that the states used the pandemic to ignore election laws and to make last minute changes that affected the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. That lawsuit filed against Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and the United States Supreme Court. Paxton's office accusing the four states of exploiting the COVID-19 pandemic just to justify ignoring federal and state election laws. The lawsuit claims this skewed the results of the 2020 general election. The suit also claims the back, back uh, the states were flooded with people with unlawful ballot applications and ballots while ignoring statutory requirements as to how they were received, evaluated and counted. It is an historic day overseas. The first people are getting Pfizer's vaccine today. ABC's Julia McFarland reports this is just part of the unprecedented rollout. This historic morning began with patient A, 90-year-old Maggie from Northern Ireland. After becoming the world's first person to be inoculated with the authorized vaccine from Pfizer and BioNTech. Hopefully it will help other people come along and uh, do as I did. Maggie was closely followed by, and you can't make it up, William Shakespeare from Warwickshire. They, alongside thousands more elderly over the age of 80, are first in line for the vaccine, the most at risk from the virus that has devastated Britain and the world this year. The UK has the highest death toll from COVID-19 in Europe, and after a difficult year fighting the pandemic, a troubled test and trace program, and the Prime Minister himself falling seriously ill from the virus... Britain today is celebrating a world first. It's amazing to see the vaccine come out. It's amazing to see this tremendous shot in the arm for the entire nation, but we can't afford to relax now. Operation Courageous is rolling out in 70 hospitals across the UK today. Since large treatment centres have the ultra-cold freezers needed to keep the vaccine at minus 94 degrees. Britain has 800,000 doses, enough to vaccinate 400,000 people in this initial phase. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine requires two doses, both spaced 21 days apart, with full immunity guaranteed from seven days after the second dose. The National Health Service is recruiting and training tens of thousands of extra staff and volunteers to help administer these injections. The British government hoping that more than 50 million people will get vaccinated, a huge challenge both of logistics and of persuasion. Julia McFarlane, ABC News, London. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has confirmed the safety data and efficiency of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. The NFDA Advisory Committee will next consider the vaccine for emergency use authorization in the United States. The group released a new briefing document ahead of Thursday's meeting where they will deliberate over the vaccine. The document also notes the most common adverse reactions to the vaccine are reactions at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle pain, chills, joint pain, and fever. Meanwhile, nationwide, more than 102,000 people are currently hospitalized with the virus in the U.S. COVID deaths are up 50 percent since just last week. For 35 straight days, the U.S. has reported more than 100,000 new cases daily, according to COVID Tracking Project. Health experts warning things will only get worse if people don't take precautions. Without substantial mitigation, the middle of January can be a really dark time for us. Governors and mayors in many areas now rushing to enact fresh rounds of restrictions.
In Bear County, we're seeing another jump in COVID-19 cases, and now that positivity rate is rising higher. So are the hospitalizations. The rapid rise will mean some businesses will be closed and more could be impacted if the numbers do not improve. The seven day average now at 993. That is up by 41 since Friday, meaning we are nearing a 1000 case a day on average and our local hospitals. 614 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized here in Bear County. 207 people are in the intensive care unit and 105 patients are on ventilators. So to come this half hour, the Spurs with another player not participating in practices. The reason coming up. And the Share the Shoes event appears to have been a big success. We have final numbers for you after the break. Every year, KSAT Community Partners with San Antonio Police and Zapatos, a local nonprofit, for our Share the Shoes initiative. We collect new shoes for members of our community to help local children in need. Max Massey shows us during this pandemic, San Antonio really has stepped up and helped out. This year's Share the Shoes initiative far surpassing expectations. Take a look. This is just from the North substation here. Look at all these bags. We are talking hundreds and hundreds of shoes. Now for a more approximate count, joined here, Officer Doug Green. So how many shoes in total did you guys collect? We have an approximately 2,070 shoes that were donated uh, to Zapato. It's gonna be, make a lot of kids happy here in San Antonio. What does that look like in comparison to last year? Man, we pretty much doubled our efforts from last year, which, was, which came as a big surprise to us because we know the challenging year that we've had here. We didn't know how much uh, people were going to be able to be in a position to give. And man, they really showed up and surprised us. What does it mean when it, you see thousands of shoes donated. What does that tell you about the people of San Antonio? Well, let me tell you, it really warms our hearts as police officers. It puts fuel in the tank uh, because we really do love this city. But when we see our city actively engaging and serving and helping each other, it just uh, really encourages us. What does the process look like from here on out? We see the shoes in the truck. Where did they go next? Well, shoes are being collected all over the city from all six of our substations. So all of our safe officers are going to be making their way to the Zapatos uh, location to drop off those shoes. We even sorted it out for them and uh, and we're going to be delivering those shoes to Zapatos and they're going to have them ready to put on some kids feet. Officer Doug Green, thank you so much. Thank you. And if you guys have any questions, we have all the answers right now. Just head to KSAT.com reporting at the North Substation. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. He's out there in the sun. It's 76 degrees. Is winter over? Did we miss it? Was that it? <laughs> this you, is fantastic weather. It's beautiful weather, but if you woke up this morning, we were in the 30s this morning. Oh, so, you know, we're kind of going back and forth between winter in the morning and springtime in the afternoon. But this weather is beautiful stargazing weather. Tonight, space station flyover at 710. We're going to see the space station. It'll be visible in the sky. It'll last only three minutes. Maximum height about 78 degrees. It'll appear in the northwest portion of the sky and disappear in the south-southwest portion of the sky. So get out there at 710 p.m. Now, Today, temperatures have warmed up really nicely. We're already at 76 degrees at the airport, 75 at JBSA Randolph, 72 in Bandera. Temperatures are nice and comfortable, and the pollen count is good, too, although we are in the middle of mountain cedar season, so it'll be interesting to see if mountain cedar makes an appearance again anytime soon. Mold is low at 150. Now, coming up, I've got to look ahead to the rest of the week and even our rain chances as we end the week. More for you after the break. Loving all the sunshine. It's so nice knowing it's going to be in the 70s. Boy, did we get to the 70s fast today. Sarah was talking about how cold it gets in the morning. Yeah. And then it gets warm in the afternoon. And there's mm -hmm. a scientific meteorological term for that. Right. We're going to come into Sarah's science classroom Ooh, briefly okay. here. Okay. I want to show you I how cold. I need to take notes. 
Yes, please, okay. David. Uh, there will down. be a pop quiz after <laughs> after the weather forecast. All right, so this morning it was cold. We got down to 38 degrees in San Antonio. That's well below our average of 43. Up in the hill country, we were seeing temperatures that were near freezing. 31 degrees in Kerrville and pockets of freezing elsewhere around San Antonio. And as you know, you go outside right now and it's really comfortable, but as soon as the sun sets, it gets pretty cold. So that's what we're going to talk about. It's called radiational cooling. That's the fancy word for it. So the earth naturally radiates heat. Whenever there are clouds in the sky at nighttime, it bounces the heat back to the surface and keeps us warm. The clouds kind of act like a blanket, right? And keep things nice and warm at the surface. But when there's a lack of cloud cover, that heat is allowed to escape up into the atmosphere and escape back out to space. The ground then cools and it gets cold pretty quickly. Now, if there is wind, if it's windy outside, the air actually mixes and the ground stays warm. But when you have the combination like we've had over the last couple of nights with no clouds, no wind, that equals a cold night. Radiational cooling. That's a pretty fun uh, trivia if you ever have that in, uh, in, in store on a trivia night. That's the reason why it gets pretty cold at night uh, this time of year. Right now outside, beautiful sunny skies, 76 degrees. Humidity is very low, only at 19%. That's why we've been able to warm up really nicely. Dry air likes to cool down and warm up quickly. Outside, it's 74 in Hondo, 71 in Yavali, 73 in Pleasanton, still 68 in Del Rio, 73 in Gonzales, and 77 in New Braunfels. Today, we're probably going to see a high temperature close to 80 degrees by 4 p.m. And then there's that radiational cooling. We're going to cool down very quickly in the evening hours. We'll already be uh, in the the upper 40s a little bit after midnight. We'll have northwest winds for the rest of the day at only about five miles per hour. Look how quiet it is across the United States right now. The only place where there is rain is the Pacific Northwest, and that is it. Everybody is enjoying quiet weather across the United States, but we can already see our next weather maker. It's currently just to the west of Baja, California, an upper level low pressure system, but it'll take its time getting here. And for the meantime, we're gonna have a ridge of high pressure in place that's gonna keep things nice and sunny through about Thursday morning. Then that upper level low is going to approach. And by Friday, we're actually gonna see a cold front move through and that'll give us a small chance, only 20% for an isolated shower, especially in the morning hours. As you can see, we're gonna be on the tail end of this system. And then another upper level low is expected to, to make things a little bit cloudier and cooler for us on Sunday. So. We get a small chance for rain on Friday and then a beautiful Saturday and then a cooler and cloudier Sunday likely in the forecast for us. One thing I want to show you over the next few days is that tomorrow we're going to wake up at 40 radiational cooling and then we'll warm up to 80 degrees tomorrow for the high temperature. Thursday is going to be an interesting day. It's going to be pretty breezy and we're going to see humidity increase, but it's not going to necessarily be muggy outside. The one thing you'll notice though is that the clouds are going to increase in the second part of the day. There's Friday with that cold front moving through 20% chance for an isolated shower uh, during the morning hours, beautiful Saturday and then a few more clouds on Sunday with the temperatures only in the low 60s for the high on Sunday and Monday. So, David, did you learn something? I learned radiational cooling, and I learned that's why all these people come down here to play golf in December and January. Yeah. February, because it gets nice during the day. And Absolutely. You can have a fire at night. <laughs> Beautiful. Hey, Spurs head coach Greg Popovich talks about another player missing training time. And the Longhorns got in a weird spot when it comes to head coaching. The San Antonio Spurs have started their second week of training camp. They are getting ready for their first of three preseason games Saturday night against Oklahoma City. We've also been given a player participation update from Spurs head coach Greg Popovich talking about the second time since training camp started. Last week he told us that Derek White, Kellen Johnson, and Kundari Witherspoon would miss the start of training camp and probably the start of the regular season on December 23rd. They're recovering from off-season surgeries or injuries. But here is a new one. Pop told us yesterday that they have also been without Lonnie Walker, the fourth. He has not practiced during camp yet, and we found out why. Three, four days ago when he had back spasms, 
So it's gotten better each day. So I'm expecting that maybe by tomorrow or the next day, he'll be back with us. I tip off in the AT&T Center for preseason game number one without fans is on Saturday. It is set for six o'clock. Second time this season, the fight in Texas Aggies have had to call off their game against Ole Miss because of COVID-19 quarantines. They had been scheduled to play Ole Miss last month, but after two players tested positive on the trip back from South Carolina, that game had to be postponed until this Saturday, December 12th. They still have a game on the 19th with Tennessee. That was rescheduled, so that game could be in jeopardy as well. The Aggies already have a game scheduled for the last open date, so the possibility of rescheduling the Ole Miss game will be a long shot. The decision will cost all of their seniors, including San Antonio's Kellen Mond, their final home game. Here's what Aggie Athletic Director Ross Bjork had to say in a statement released last night. He said, while we are extremely disappointed to miss the opportunity to play our last home game of the 2020 season and honor our senior class, we understood that any scenario throughout this public health crisis was a possibility, end quote. Hey, for all you Texas Longhorn fans looking for a new head football coach, it'll not be Urban Meyer. That's according to 24-7 Sports. He will not replace Tom Herman. Remember, Meyer got out of coaching because of health issues, and that's the same reason he will not get back into coaching, at least not now. So what does athletic director Chris De La Conte do now? The best the Horns can finish the regular season is 7-3, and this is with a win over Kansas on Saturday. That game... Had to be postponed by the Jayhawks last month due to COVID-19. Texas had three players and two staff members test positive this past Sunday, so now all activities are paused, meaning the game is once again in jeopardy. And some sad news for Longhorn fans. Former Longhorn head coach Fred Akers passed away. He was the head coach at UT from 1977 to 1986, and after spending a total of 19 years on the Longhorn staff, he took over for Darrell Rule following Royals retirement, compiling a record of 86-31 and two winning Southwest Conference titles, 1977 and 83, including Earl Campbell's 77 Heisman Trophy season. He was the third all-time winning as coach in Longhorn history behind both Royal and Mac Brown. Fred Akers was 82, and it's always hard to follow a legend, but he kept things going the way Darrell Royal had him in the right direction, so. Amazing record. Yeah, it was. From the first time you heard the Beatles to the opening chords of Black Sabbath's Iron Man and Chuck Berry's iconic strumming. Good music as a way of giving you, has a way of giving you the chills. And coming up in the next half hour, why music will have this effect on us. And a new study shows the risk of catching COVID-19 inside a car. However, there are things you can do to lower the chances. And doing most of your holiday shopping online this year, while it takes the stress out of shopping in store, then also add the, ooh, add to the nice list. But instead of Santa, it's scammers. It's coming up today at 5, 12 on your side, Marilyn Morris with the holiday scams you should be aware of before you become the next easy target. President Donald Trump hosting a vaccine summit at the White House today to tout the success of Operation Warp Speed. ABC's Elizabeth Schultz reports the Trump administration, though, also facing scrutiny over its decision to exclude the incoming Biden administration's transition team and over reports that they turned down an offer to buy millions more doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine. With the distribution of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine now underway in the UK, the White House is facing new questions about its vaccination planning efforts here in the U.S. ABC News has confirmed a New York Times report saying the Trump administration turned down an offer from Pfizer to buy additional doses of its vaccine this summer, potentially delaying the timeline for tens of millions of Americans to receive the inoculations. This morning, the head of Operation Warp Speed defending that decision. In the summer, if somebody came to us and said, let's buy more of this vaccine or that vaccine, no one reasonably would buy more from any one of those vaccines because we didn't know which one would work and which one may be better than the other. The U.S. government decided to purchase 100 million doses of Pfizer's vaccine, enough to vaccinate 50 million Americans because of the two-phase dosage regimen. By contrast, the European Union bought 200 million doses from Pfizer. The news coming as the White House hosts a summit where President Trump is expected to continue touting his administration's success developing a vaccine.
Vaccines are on their way at a level that nobody ever thought possible. Notably absent from the summit will be Pfizer and Moderna, the two companies closest to getting their vaccines authorized in the U.S., as well as anyone from the incoming Biden administration that will ultimately be overseeing the distribution process. President-elect Biden has voiced concerns the White House is not sharing enough details about its vaccine rollout plan. There is no detailed plan that we've seen anyway. Adding to the confusion, President Trump will issue an executive order today that would prioritize Americans' access to a vaccine before the U.S. helps other countries. The move sending a clear America first message, but it's unclear how it would be enforced since the companies are already doing deals with other countries. President-elect Biden will be holding his own public health event this afternoon in Wilmington, Delaware, to formally introduce members of his health team who will be in charge of leading the response to the pandemic. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News. Washington. Georgia's top election official has recertified the state's election results after a recount confirmed again that Joe Biden defeated President Donald Trump in that state. The governor then recertified Georgia's 16 presidential electors. President Trump requested this recount, which is the third tally showing Biden won Georgia. State law allows a losing candidate to request a recount if the margin between the candidates is within a half a point. Results certified by Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger showed Biden led by a margin of 12,670 votes. That's roughly 0.25 percent. An audit involving a hand count of the paper ballots also showed that Biden won. Researchers at a cybersecurity firm say millions of our smart devices are vulnerable to hacking because of the software that's being used in them. They say that the flaws could be exploited by hackers to get into business and home computer networks and disrupt them. So far, no one has done it, but the possibility that it could happen prompted cybersecurity officials to flag this issue. The devices range from networked thermometers to smart plugs and even printers. Outside with live cam, usually when I get home in the afternoon, I'm seeing kids getting off the bus. Mm -hmm. In the mornings, I pass a couple of them, they're all bundled up, yeah. just trying to stay warm. And then when Those they get off puffy. the bus, they got like all their coats over their shoulders. Right. And their mom's like, don't forget your coat. Exactly. Those puffy marshmallow coats in the morning and then short sleeves in the afternoon. That's exactly the weather pattern we'll continue to have over the next couple of days. Take a look outside with the satellite image. And it, honestly, only a few cirrus clouds out there streaming south of San Antonio. Other than that, it is sunny and it's starting to get warm out there. It's 76 degrees at the airport. 77 in New Braunfels, 73 in Kerrville, 74 in Hondo, 73 in Pleasanton, 68 in Del Rio, so still in the 60s out west, uh, 72 in Creasa Springs, and 70 in Laredo. Wider view here, not a cloud in the sky from San Antonio all the way up to Kansas. And tonight, it'll be great viewing weather for a station. Uh, space station, pardon me, flyover starts at 710. Last three minutes, maximum height of about 76 degrees. It'll appear in the northwest portion of the sky and disappear in the south southwest. So you only got three minutes. So make sure you get out there at 710. Hey, coming up, I'm going to have an updated look at the aquifer level. Looks like the aquifer is taking a bit of a hit over the next couple of days. Thank you, Sarah. Turning now to the coronavirus pandemic, a new study shows there's a risk of infection inside a car but rolling down specific windows may lower those chances. A group of Brown University researchers looked at airflow patterns inside a car. The study played out scenarios from a compact car with two people in it. When all the windows were rolled up, air particles were trapped circulating between the two people inside the car. Researchers say blasting the heat or AC doesn't circulate air nearly as well as opening windows. However, Instead of only having a few windows rolled down, experts say the most effective way to diffuse aerosol particles is by keeping all the windows open. And that's not surprising because we would expect that the more windows are open, the more circulation of air there is and the, and the easier it is to flush uh, any contaminants out of the car. The study found opening the window across from you actually helps optimize airflow even more rather than the window next to you. And while there needs to be more research about how COVID is transmitted inside the car, the CDC says when you are in a confined space, you should wear a mask and you should sit as far apart as possible. According to a new study, significant stress in pregnant women can affect the brains of their babies. The director of the Developing Brain Institute at Children's National in Washington, D.C., says this research looks at toxic levels of stress defined as interfering with day-to-day -day responsibilities. It shows that stress, 
causes weaker connections between two brain areas tied to higher cognitive and executive functions. And it strengthens connections between brain areas tied to behavioral and emotional controls. Whether it's the final movement of Beethoven's fifth or something a little more modern, good music has the ability to give you the chills. But where do those chills come from? ABC's Alex Boucher explains why music can't have that effect on us. Frisson, a noun from the French word frisson, meaning shiver, is a sensation of chills that many of us have experienced while listening to a piece of music, viewing a work of art, or in some cases while tuning into an ASMR video on YouTube. We just pop in. For some, the experience is accompanied by goosebumps. Others may notice their pupils dilating. Either way, this feeling is a physical manifestation of enjoyment. Now, a team of French scientists have identified patterns of brain activity that may be responsible for creating a frisson. By measuring the brain waves of 18 participants as they listen to their favorite chill-inducing piece of music, the researchers found that when a person experiences a frisson, the electrical activity in parts of their brain responsible for emotional processing, movement control, and sound processing changes. It's believed the altered activity in these regions allow the listener to process the music and triggers the brain's reward system to release dopamine, the pleasure hormone. Prior studies suggest a key part of a frisson is a violation of expectations. So if you're looking for more spine-chilling music, try looking beyond your usual repertoire or find a new cover of a song you already love. With this Medical Minute, I'm Alex Perche, ABC News. There's a child in New England right now who's missing a toy, but he's in some good hands how employees at a Home Depot are keeping him safe until he can find the owner and giving him some new experiences too. Plus, Sesame Street is giving parents a few positive tips when it comes to children having fear and anxiety during the pandemic. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar. SpaceX has been awarded roughly $900 million in federal aid from the FCC. The funding is going to be used to support rural broadband customers through the company's Starlink satellite internet network by bringing high-speed internet to rural areas of the U.S. that otherwise have poor internet connection. Meanwhile, Ford is pushing back the launch date for the new Bronco. The full-size Bronco SUV was supposed to come out in spring of 2021, but it's now being delayed until summer due to COVID-related supply challenges. However, the smaller version of the SUV, the Bronco Sport, came out last month and is already available at several dealerships. And listen up, pizza lovers. Pizza Hut is now launching a three-in-one meal special in a triple decker box, especially for the holidays. The triple treat box will include two medium one-topping pizzas in the top and middle levels and five breadsticks, along with 10 mini cinnamon rolls from Cinnabon on the bottom level. The box will soon be available at Pizza Hut locations nationwide and it's priced at $21 a box. And that's your Cheddar Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado, coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. Some employees at Home Depot spending their free time training a new team member. And you just might recognize him. It's Sheriff Woody from Pixar's Toy Story Films. Employees at the New Hampshire store say they found the toy in the store's parking lot. They think a child lost him, so staffers launched a campaign on social media and by word of mouth to find the child who lost Woody. Meantime, Woody got a small apron, usually reserved for the employees of the month, while learning how to saw wood and stir paint. Yeah, everyone's having fun with it. He's working in the garden and the paint section. He's, he's a jack of all trades by this point. We haven't discussed payment yet, but we'll get there. Ferguson says he and his co-workers have some leads on Woody's possible owner, but they still don't know for sure. <laughs> <Pretty good. sighs> Woody's Pretty cute. <laughs> That's cute. Live look outside. We got a, a little weather lesson earlier today from Sarah yeah. Spivey. Mother Nature's blankie is what I like to call radiational cooling. Oh, well, it's the opposite of that. It actually allows for the heat to escape, but yeah. I like that phrasing, Ursula. That's kind of cute. All right, mold is low at 150. Uh, that's the only allergen out there, but you know what? Aquifer, it's actually down almost a whole foot over the past 24 hours, and it's below average by more than seven feet. We need rain. We do have a small chance for rain in the forecast. 
But I do have something fun coming up in the forecast. A chance for a white Christmas across the nation coming up in a bit. This Essay Salutes Holiday Greeting is brought to you by Texas Med Clinic. On behalf of all of the staff at Texas Med Clinic in New Braunfels, we'd like to wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season. Happy, happy holidays! holidays. <laughs> We're enjoying some gorgeous weather. Um, the only thing that could be making it a little bit nicer is the possibility of a white Christmas. <laughs> Oh. Well, David told me, don't tease me, Sarah. Yeah, don't, if that's and, not going to happen here, don't even say it. You know what? I won't tease you. I'll show you. It's less okay. than a percent chance okay. of a white oh, Christmas in San Antonio. Man. But there was, there was a time in 2004 when there was mm -hmm. snow on the ground from Galveston all the way down to Brownsville. Remember so, it well. Woo. Let's see what this here has in store for us. But as you can see across uh, southern uh, plains, a zero to 10 percent chance. That's about it. Uh, but across parts of the uh, central plains, about a 40 to 60 percent chance. And there's about a 100 percent chance of at least an inch of snow on the ground for places in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And of course, across the Rockies as well. But today is a day where everybody is pretty dry. We are not seeing a drop of rain or a flake of snow across the continental U.S. There are a few areas where it's showing a little bit of light rain out near the Pacific Northwest, but that's about it. High pressure system is really in play right now. High pressure system creates sinking air, which prevents not only rain, but also cloud cover. And as you can see, it's uh, pretty clear across parts of Texas, most of Texas. But our next weather maker is currently out near Baja, California, upper level low pressure system. This is going to take its time getting to us. It's really not going to make it to San Antonio until late Thursday and early Friday. Until then, there's that high pressure system. You can kind of see how a ridge in the upper levels of the atmosphere sends all of the precipitation up and around Texas. We're going to see sunny skies, chilly mornings and comfortable afternoons through Thursday. Uh, we are going to see that upper level low bring a cold front through San Antonio on Friday, but look at the rain with it. Really the better chance for storms and showers is up across parts of North Texas and into Oklahoma. We're on the tail end of that system, so really all we can expect is about a 20% chance for an isolated shower, especially in the first part of the day on Friday. And then we'll have a beautiful Saturday, but by Sunday, it looks like we're going to see another upper level low, a trough of low pressure uh, work its way through and so Sunday will probably be a little bit cloudier and cooler as well. I'll show you the seven day forecast in a bit, but for right now, this is the picture we've seen over San Antonio uh, the last couple of days. Beautiful view of downtown. We've even had a little bit of haze on the horizon. Air quality is moderate. Uh, it's not a danger to anybody, but it is moderate right now because of some particulate matter, some pollution in the air. Uh, but that's about it. 76 degrees, mostly sunny skies and pretty dry outside. Dew points are only in the 30s and humidity's at 19%. We've seen temperatures rebound nicely. We were in the 30s this morning. We're at 77 in a Lotus, 77 at Rio Medina, 74 in Hondo, 72 at Bernie Stage Airfield, 77 in New Braunfels. A wider view here it's still in the 60s in Del Rio, but they're probably going to get into the 70s. And here in San Antonio, we are going to be seeing a really pleasant afternoon with a high temperature near 80 degrees. It'll get chilly pretty quickly uh, tonight with temperatures already in the upper 40s by midnight. North winds uh, for the rest of the day at about five miles per hour. One of the reasons why uh, we've been able to be chilly in the morning and comfortable in the afternoon is the really dry air in place. Dew points are in the 20s and in the 30s, even in the teens in parts of the hill country. But watch what happens to dew points uh, through Thursday. We see our winds change to the south. By Thursday morning, it's still going to be nice and dry outside, but by Thursday afternoon and evening, dew points are going to surge up into the 60s and it'll be a little muggy before that front moves through on Friday. And that's why we had that small chance there for an isolated shower on Friday. But a beautiful weekend. It is going to get chilly, though, for Sunday and Monday. We'll have cold mornings in the 30s and afternoon high temperatures only near 60 degrees. We'll be right back.
Sesame Street helping families through the pandemic with new animations. The new cartoons are designed to inspire positive child care strategies and help young children express big feelings such as fear and stress. One film features Grover celebrating the holidays with extended family over a video call. The other shows baby Elmo talking through the fear and anxiety he feels about the pandemic. The animations will be released on Sesame Street website. So today on SA Live, Fiona is carrying the Ooh. whole load well, here. You know, she can handle it. Look how strong oh. she is. Oh, oh look at her, superwoman. But no worries, okay? May, maybe you have a crafter in your family or it's you that loves to make gifts for everyone. If so, here we go. We got Jennifer Nicolella here with Abby's Attic and she is going to be showing you how to make some great handmade gifts. But That's first, cool. I love what you have right there. That is the oh, Santa oh, beard oh. face mask. We're gonna show you how you can make that. But take a look over here. You did a cynical Christmas tree, That's right? right? That's right. We have the dumpster fire. <laughs> That sums up 2020. That just sums it up. We have some F-bombs. If you're on a, um, a Zoom call, <laughs> throw those at the screen so you can't actually say it. This is our cynical Christmas tree. Yes, and coming up, we're going to show you how you can make these cute little ugly sweater ornaments. Lots of fun that the kids can have uh, with that. And also, it is National Poncha Day. So, of course, we want to thank La Panaderia for sending over these yummy treats. And we're gonna tell you how you can spread holiday cheer to the kids that need it the most this Christmas season with SAU Stuffing the Stocking Campaign. Also, think about this question. Would you try a Pan Dulce burger? Weigh in online at SA Live Case out on Facebook and Twitter and we'll air some of those comments in the show.